in Clinton, Arkansas, where the South meets the Midwest and where a rebel tradition still survives. This was a year when the two-party consensus confronted a series of rebellions. But meanwhile, what could be more down home than a chuck wagon race? 1992 was very much the year of the home front, the first since the end of the Cold War, and the most narcissistic and self-absorbed that I've seen in covering four election campaigns. Here is the America that candidates dare not ignore, a touch introspective perhaps, but solid and pious and patriotic. Lord, I'm sure that you're aware there's trouble on the range and the outlaw still rides. Lord, we pray that you go with each one of these contestants in today's racing competition and we pray that through this competition it might strengthen their bodies and they could serve you better. And Lord, we pray that someday each one of us will ride on your side of the fence for it's your great name that we pray. Amen. And now Troy Booyer and the playing <coughs> of our national anthem. <laughs> Middle America in 1992 was not to be stirred by dramas beyond the seas. Instead, it judged a good American by his commitment to the domestic hearth. It hadn't looked like a home front campaign at the beginning of 1991. George Bush's trouncing of his former pal Saddam Hussein sent Democrats like Al Gore and Mario Cuomo hurtling for cover. The president, it seemed, held the electorate, the press, and the Congress in the hollow of his hand. He even made himself cry by invoking that tired phrase, the American dream. It lives because we dared risk our most precious asset, our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, our husbands and wives, the finest troops any country has ever had. The Congress itself became a platform for the imperial presidency. By 1992, it often seemed, the dome of the US Capitol enclosed not just the political center of the new world, but of a new world order. To this place came Boris Yeltsin, Nelson Mandela, Lech Wałęsa, Václav Havel, they came not just as supplicants, but as admirers of the American idea. The whole world, it seemed, wanted the American model. And just in 1992, that year of their first unchallenged political supremacy, the Americans began to look at themselves and didn't like what they saw. The greatest deliberative body in the West, as a result of a series of scandals and revelations, began to look more like a den of thieves and opportunists. Honest men and women made haste to resign from it. And the term incumbent became the least sought after compliment in American politics. Incumbency also became a burden to George Bush as he tried to blame the Congress for the nation's ills. George come home! George come home! Rush fire rebellions broke out across the parties and beyond them. Pat Buchanan, a primitive right-wing isolationist, crudely evoked the America First appeal of his 1930s ancestors. Buchanan might well not have run had not the ex-Nazi and Klansman David Duke pointed up a deep, hidden resentment among the less polished white voters. While Jerry Brown rallied the 60s radicals for one last try at leftist populism and grassroots democracy. As Brown faded, Anti-incumbency found a grotesque new outlet when Ross Perot emerged from the heart of Texas. If not as the fabled Lone Ranger, at least as a man with both money and a mouth. He had a fantasy of America run like a non-political, no-nonsense corporation, free from foreign influence. The campaign had barely begun when the flames of Los Angeles, second city of the country, eclipsed the flames of Kuwait in the national memory. I just, I just want to say, you know, can we, can we all get along? Can we, can we get along? 
From May 92 onwards, those who spoke of the priority of the home front had realism and the headlines on their side. Ten days after the riots, I visited the leading black church of South Central Los Angeles. The spirit and the imagery of the old civil rights movement was still alive and well, in spite of years of neglect and despite being long out of fashion among politicians of both parties. Former San Francisco Mayor Diane Feinstein thought it prudent to wear the colors of Africa to church to make her point as she ran for Senate in what some were already calling the year of the woman. There's a convergence between the woman's agenda and the domestic agenda of this country because Americans want our country to come home and address itself to domestic priorities. And we're so behind in building our infrastructure, both our human and our physical infrastructure. And so that's, I'm a former mayor uh, of a city, and uh, my uh, concerns really rest with cities and how you build those cities and how you provide economic development and job opportunities for people. Further down the ladder of America's allegedly non-existent class system, the boys in the hood regarded American politics and all American politicians as part tragic and part farcical. You know there's an election going on. Yes. Does it affect you at all? I mean, it affects me to the point to where I wouldn't vote for none of the people that's in office and people that's trying to get in office. I mean, as far as voting on people, I'm not into that. Do you think voting changes anything? Huh? Do you think oh. voting changes anything? No. no. How about you? I don't think so. If a black man ever make it a president, he's not going to last long. Okay. I if, he ever, if he ever make it, he won't last about two or three days. I'll give you a prime example. The, the, whole, the whole basic thing is racial. Feinstein, Feinstein for one of her commercials cost $25,000 for uh, three minutes, okay? She could have took that $25,000. Now, this is the ex-mayor of San Francisco now. She could have took that $25,000 and brought it back and put it back in, in San Francisco since she cares so much about San Francisco. What do you think when you hear there's a billionaire trying to get in the race, Mr. Perot? I, 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 I love it, I love it. We taste some, I would like vote that? for him. I would yeah, vote I like for him. him. You think he's too rich to steal? He fine both. Something that, that politicians do anyway, but they're scared to admit that's what they're doing. Quitting the ghetto for West Hollywood, I talked with Pat Cadell, who masterminded the victory of Jimmy Carter, America's last Democratic president. It was May, and the Democrats were lying third behind Perot. What did he think was going on? It's a rebellion. I mean, the American people are rebelling as directly as they once rebelled against uh, uh, their uh, British uh, cousins. And what are the sources of this frustration? Well, I think, first of all, I mean, the major source of it is the fact that is the sense that Americans, that the country isn't working, the politics isn't working, but more importantly to, with that, the sense that they've lost control of the political system much as they would have with their own, their own lives. I would say the thing that really defines Americans above all else, the character, is a national, and in its character is the sense that <clears throat> the most important commandment to being an American is that you leave your children better than you have. I heard that from my mother's knee, and I believe that if you violate that moral covenant, you kill that idea, you will kill America. And that's what's animating in a consciousness across this country. But no one even speaks to that. I'm waiting for the first politician who will speak morally to the issue of commitment to what the idea of America is and to its children. Americans are often said to have short memories. But the 1988 election, where the pathetic Michael Dukakis was destroyed by Cold War and racial scares and by nasty soundbite tactics, has not been forgotten, or by many people, forgiven. 
Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. I'd say that after the presidential election in 1988, I, for one, felt ashamed to be in this business. I mean, does the ends justify the means? It's that old thing. And I don't think it does. And uh, I'm a great advocate and devotee of George Bush. I'm one of his 2,000 best friends who he writes to and calls all the time. And I love the man. But even George, I think, was appalled by uh, the caliber of the campaign last time and tried to distance himself from it immediately. He didn't want to talk about it. But yet, I guess the guilt is he accepts it. In fact, in 1992, Bush stooped every bit as low. Americans want to be proud of Washington as a city and bring their children to see the great temples of law and history and justice. But they dislike and distrust it as a federal capital, correctly seeing it as corrupt and incompetent. This year, both Congress and the executive have looked more than usually shabby, with congressmen shamelessly on the take and the White House tainted by the hangover of Iran-Contra and the mounting scandal over illegal loans to Iraq. In Washington, money doesn't talk, it swears. We have a gong show going on in American politics. It's about taking intelligent men, and some not so intelligent, and some women, and parading them before very wealthy people in their dining rooms, having them do their little tap dance, uh, their schmoozing, whatever they have to do to get huge sums of money to buy television ads to be taken seriously by the print press. That's an absurdity. It's a prostitution. It's a degeneration of democracy. Tim Worth of Colorado, a much-liked and well-respected Democrat, resigned from the Senate this year while he was ahead in the polls and ahead in fundraising. I asked him, how come? I felt that... Um the logjam or the gridlock that we faced in the Congress was enormously frustrating. The deficit is just swamping uh, the United States of America. Uh, the role of money has in American politics has been absolutely devastating. It's the it's the great cancer in our system, and uh, I just you know got very very tired of beating my head against the wall. Uh, it was beginning to affect me as a personality. I didn't uh, like myself doing a lot of the things that I was doing, and so I said, hey, <laughs> you only live once, I'm going to go do something else. I think the worst part of being in the Senate was the confirmation of Clarence Thomas. And then to see the hearings with Anita Hill broadcast across the country, the, all the mystique of the United States Senate disappeared. You know, there was a, a sense that this is the greatest deliberative body in the world, the Senate, but then people saw senators up there kowtowed, terrified, ill-prepared. It was a disgraceful time. And then some of the members of my party voted for Clarence Thomas. It's enough to make you ill. And health care, and our rights, and our children's rights, and the American dream, the fact that... Anita Hill's dignified defiance helped ignite a strong feminine and feminist upsurge in 1992. Those women who rode the wave included an unprecedented two Senate nominees in California. On Tuesday, it's in your hands. Let's go do it. Thank you very much. Also breaking into politics was Carol Mosley Brown of Illinois, who could become the Senate's first black woman. Well, I think when the Senate went on television, it demystified itself to the American people, and uh, they didn't like what they saw, and they want to change, and they see women as change agents, and in my state, uh, uh, I was seen as a, as a viable alternative to the incumbent uh, senator, and so I ran, and I won the primary, and now I'm running for the general election. What was the thing that mo moved you most strongly? My son saying, Mom, your generation has left this world worse off than you found it. I thought that's it, that means I've got to get out there and do something. It was never entirely clear, as he ducked in and out of the race like some spoiled, overgrown, rich kid, whether Ross Perot was bidding for Middle America or for the paranoid fringe. Now, because you won't have the benefits for 15 to 20 years. Every day is precious. 
and we just talk about it. And one last nice lady came up and she... Looked His really bizarre campaign now, did draw some simple souls who wanted to take politics out of politics and saw nothing odd in giving money to a billionaire. Said, yes, I will. But it also acted as a magnet for every crackpot in the land. At one Perot HQ, I ran smack into a full-time volunteer called Ed. You done anything political before? Never. So what's different about this time? Well, the country's at risk. Go on. Simply put, it goes, with, it goes without saying that if we keep going on the path that we're going, this country isn't going to be America anymore. The borders aren't secure, the money isn't any good. Outside interests are more or less dictating. There's a very interesting piece of documentation running around stating that uh, the company Sony, nobody's ever been able to figure out where the title comes from. And uh, the information uh, come to light recently that it stands for Standard Oil of New York. That ought to be, that ought to be a nice tie-in to the Rockefeller family and the trilateralists and the, the uh, Council on uh, Foreign Relations, etc., etc. Ed's was the classic vocabulary of the fruitcake conspiratorial isolationist. Was that all there was to it? I'm not sure how I feel about Ross Perot. I, I mean, I, I, um, I believe, I understand, I, I think he's making a major contribution to showing what's happening. And I think he could, he could end up being one of the most fundamentally um, uh, historic Americans. Uh, you know, he has a way, I've been thinking about it, if you consider this rebellion someone like the American Revolution, he has a chance uh, to be a George Washington kind of figure. I would hate to face the test he has to face. Because he's either got to rise to a level where he is the embodiment of the collective voice of the American people, or we will turn out to watch an ego exercise by a very narrow, limited man. As it turned out, Ross Perot was no George Washington. This is suburbia. Here is Simi Valley, home of the Rodney King jury. But it could be Middletown, USA, refuge of the middle class as it deserts the decaying cities. The majority here is anything but silent. 1992, as well as being the year of the presidential election in America, it's also the year of the census. It hasn't been a census for some little time in the United States. And this one had one very amazing finding in it, which is that 50% of Americans now count themselves, list themselves as suburbanites. That's to say more people say they live in suburbs than say they live in urban or rural areas. This is historically unprecedented. Nobody quite knows what its political fallout is going to be. We know one thing for sure. People who live in streets like this are very tax sensitive. They don't trust the federal government to spend their money. And they don't want them spending it on people who don't live in places like this. As a result, we have to think of the American present and the American future as increasingly dominated by this sort of concern. The Democratic Party hasn't yet found a way of meeting this. The Republican Party almost certainly has. That was back in May, and I spoke too soon there. Bill Clinton was quick to get the suburban point, and never mentioned any class but the middle from one end of the campaign to the other. He promised them tax cuts and all sorts of treats, while Bush took them for granted. The election became a contest of respectabilities, with all painful issues postponed or ignored. Many topics went unmentioned as the candidates tried to bring only good news. The richest country in the history of the world has become a debtor nation, and the price of the Cold War is only beginning to be paid. Did George Bush have a clue about this? I think, uh, you know, you're insulated to a degree being president, and everybody's telling you things are good. Look at all the numbers, Mr. President. And he accepted that. And then when things went awry, it was what to do about it. And uh, I might have told you this, Chris. I ran to a party, you know, ran to the president and his wife at a party about four months ago for an aide who had just gotten over a cancer problem. And uh, it was wonderful for George and Barbara to appear and stay three hours. And I said to him, I asked him, I said, uh, you know, you're, this economy is in deep trouble. What are you going to do about it? And his answer was, I think the best thing might be to do nothing figuring that it would straighten itself out. He was afraid of tampering with it politically. That line might be Bush's political obituary. 
The two-party system responds mainly to campaign contributors, so it isn't very good at discussing matters like the dying urban landscape, the superannuated military-industrial complex, or the wave of new immigration. 1992 was a year when people asked what their country could do for them. Well, how can president go from 90% popularity to being laughed at in the streets? And basically, that's what he's ridiculed. He's not even taken seriously. And the answer is, is because I think he violated what he made the, when he went to the American people on the Saddam Hussein issue. I think he made a, a he did something that was, that violated the basic moral precepts of the presidency. He went in and he cloaked himself in the moral authority of the president, took it out of the covenant and put it on and said, the issue here is the issue of freedom and democracy. We have a moral commitment for this war. When he invoked that, those magic words of moral commitment, he invoked them and then the country went along and it swept to victory. But you know what? And then it broke down the week after when the Kurdish situation, when it was clear that Saddam Hussein, they were not going to get rid of Saddam Hussein, but worse, that we stood by while Kurds were being murdered, that Muslims were being murdered, helicopters flying in the air. The fact of the matter is, somehow in the American subconscious again, it connected that they had been lied to. When George Bush began to slide, there was no stopping him. His alleged strong cards had been his expertise at foreign policy and his close ties with the military ethic. To collapse puking on the shoes of the Japanese during disastrous trade talks in Tokyo might look like misfortune. Tell us the truth. But to lose his rag with the wives and widows of Vietnam veterans looked like carelessness. Would you please be quiet and let me finish? Would you please shut up and sit down? And careless at best, was Bush's decision to surrender the Republican convention to his old antagonists on the barking right. People he had to pretend to like, but who no one else did. But remember, not everyone joined the counterculture. Not everyone demonstrated, dropped out, took drugs, joined in the sexual revolution, or dodged the draft. Not since Barry Goldwater in 1964 had the ravers and the headbangers been given such a free hand. George Bush is a defender of right to life and a champion of the Judeo-Christian values and beliefs upon which America was founded. Elect me. And you get two for the price of one, Mr. Clinton says, of his lawyer spouse. And what? <laughs> and what does Hillary believe? Well, Hillary believes that 12 year olds should have the right to sue their parents. And Hillary has compared marriage and the family as institutions to slavery and life on an Indian reservation. Well, speak for yourself, Hillary. Playing one kind of domestic appeal against another, the Bush Quail campaign tried to pit family values against the Democrats' emphasis on recession and unemployment. It was a contrived issue and it didn't play with the uncommitted. Though at the Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock, Arkansas, a sickly version of Puritanism did have some resonance among those who like to think of themselves as a flock. Just your sticker. Yes. Uh -huh. and it's a new one on me. I wonder if you could tell me what. Well, the, the Speak Up for Decency is to promote uh, uh, awareness. Of, of there were some newspapers in this area that were advertising uh, 
uh, a lot of the homosexual ads and things like this that we don't think small children could, could get their hands on it. We're here in Arkansas and uh, have an opportunity to see what Governor Clinton has actually stood for. Um, I, I don't think he knows the concept of family values. Um, most evidently perhaps by the fact that he and his wife attend different churches and they've given their daughter the opportunity to um, attend a church of her choice as well. That's a divided family, in my opinion. I asked Newt Gingrich, supposedly the most intelligent of the House Republicans, about the narrowing of his party to the moral majority and other extremists. I think that's nonsense. I think that's a comment on how narrow the press corps is. Uh, let me give you some examples. The President and I both favor a balanced budget amendment. That is a 65% issue. The opposition is about 17 to 20%. We both favor voluntary school prayer. That's about a 75, 76% issue. We both favor capital punishment and particularly vicious crimes. That's a 74% issue. We both favor requiring people to work if they're on welfare. That's an 81% issue. Now, if we are defining 65, 74, 77, and 81% of the American people, who's the extremist? Well, I'm, too, I'm speaking in particular about the image presented at your convention where it appeared that if you didn't have a, a white Christian pro-life consciousness, yeah, you were somehow and, unwelcome. And that's frankly just plain a lie. I don't know of a single person in our convention who's talked about a white Christian family. Not a single person. That is a news media distortion. That is the paranoia of the American elite culture. Remind me what you said about Woody Allen at that rally in Georgia the other day for the president. All I said was that Woody Allen was a perfect example of the difference in the two parties because we believe that families raise children. The Democrats in their platform plank said very explicitly, quote, governments don't raise children, people raise children. And my point was that that's exactly wrong. It's not people who raise children, it's families. A single mother with two children is called a family. But as I recall, you had a more epigrammatic way of phrasing that. Oh yeah, my, my, the, the formula which I thought was very fair was that by, by his own definition, Woody Allen was, was, was uh, in a situation of having non-incest with a non-daughter because he was a non-father in a non-family. And there got to be a big uproar. And my only point is, tell me, tell me a single thing that's factually wrong about that. I don't know how well do you know the Allen family. I've read his, I've read his explanations in, in Time Magazine. Against right-wing family values, the Clinton campaign decided to counterpose a holy family, the ever-charismatic Kennedys, who make up America's most dysfunctional dynasty. The first campaign picture of Bill Clinton I ever saw had him shaking hands with JFK. Does he want to be Jack or Bobby? I think Bill Clinton has directly uh, tried to position himself as the heir to Robert Kennedy on a substantive line that tries to distinguish between the interest group politics uh, that the party's been tied up with, I think, largely since Senator Kennedy's death, for people who had been involved in that campaign, and also for all of us in, our, in the generation that we share, having seen so many of our leaders uh, killed at the time when our generation was coming through a formative experience, too young for leadership in the main, old enough to die uh, in Vietnam. In July of the Democratic Convention, nothing was left to chance by the new breed of Democratic smoothie. So give me like a couple of people on this side, a couple of people you think can handle that kind of thing, that would come down, get, and, you know, we'll have to get the, don't worry about Secret yeah. Service, screw it, we'll just take Okay, there's applause, up. right? And I'll be out here and I'll go like this. Okay, so it's the first line first. Care was even taken to neutralize and contain the last remaining dissenter, Jerry Brown. Let's walk through the schedule for a second. All right. Okay. All right. First things first. First, let's concentrate on the rules plan. The report will come up first. There'll be debate. Governor Brown is introduced at 747. Okay? 747. It is important that we get the message out that we give the proper response to Governor Brown. Okay, we want to be appropriate, we want to be deferential and polite. Hold on. At 8.04 there will be a demonstration by Governor Brown's campaign that will last approximately 10 to 20 minutes. 
We just we just sit back and watch. Let everybody have their day. All right, look, at 8 o'clock, the demonstration after Jenny, Jerry Brown speaks, let them demonstrate, just everybody sit down, and, you know, the faster we do this, the quicker it'll all just go by. And then at 8.26, Songus is going to speak, and after that, he is going to have a present or a demonstration. It can be difficult to fill up a whole convention week if you've decided in advance that you want to hold down the argument, contain the controversy, go light on the politics. The answer's ready to hand in the city like New York, capital of entertainment. There's always orchestration. There's always choreography. In the old days, a convention floor, especially a democratic convention floor, was often more like a, a bear pit or a battleground. Rebellious delegates had to be gaveled down, sometimes even clubbed down by the forces of law and order. Today, there's an easier solution, one readier to hand. The ringmaster just has to turn up the music. The incessant call to be struck was that of Bobby Kennedy and the passing of the torch. Agonizingly corny as this was, it worked as the old tearjerkers invariably do. The delegates were treated to a husky, weepy retrospective of Bobby's life. The prayer he asked for America would not be answered in his lifetime. Perhaps for his children, but not for him be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. Those of us who loved him pray that what he was to us, what he wished for others, will someday come to pass for all the world. I know every day that I'm alive, I hope I'm a better person than the day before. I hope that every day from this day forward, we can be a nation coming together instead of coming apart. And I hope that we as a people will always acknowledge that each child in our country is as important as our own. I still believe these things are possible. I still believe in the promise of America. And I still believe in a place called hope. Thus, the life of Bill, as remade by some Hollywood friends of his. The convention was rightly derided at the time for its pseudo-Camelot stage management on behalf of the man the Republicans called Slick Willie. But it did mark Clinton's turning point in the unstable opinion polls. We took one of the poorest states in America and lifted it up. And so, I say all to all of those in this campaign season who would criticize Arkansas, come on down. So I did. In Slick Willie's bar in Little Rock, Arkansas, I found that the youth vote was divided, both on the famous issue of character and on Clinton's stewardship of his home state. Well, the primary thing that I think of is that he's raised the education standards to a level to where they meet or exceed the national requirements, and that hasn't been done in, well, since the beginning of the state. As far as the personal infidelity or alleged infidelity because he's never admitted having such I don't think we're that I don't feel personally that plays a big part in the election but if it does it, the same thing can be said about George Bush he's had a chick for many years and everyone knows about it Bush supports everything the good Christian values and like the all-american family and everything and uh, he's not for abortion and uh, as a Christian I can't condone that kind of uh, decision-making in Bill Clinton. The leading local scribe thought Clinton less like Kennedy, more like Kennedy's oldest rival, Slick Willie as Tricky Dicky. I'd be very curious to find out just what Bill Clinton's character is. I don't think of him as having a very strong character. I think of him 
as being a hollow man, as empty at the core. I don't know if I could name you a single principle that Bill Clinton would not sacrifice in order to gain the next office. I'm not sure where his real emotional commitment is. I haven't found it. Some days Bill Clinton reminds me a little of Richard Nixon. I sense the same absence of a central core and the constant attempt to correct his stories and present himself in a better light to the public and above all a devotion to winning the approval of others rather than himself. Could you give an instance of this opportunist style? I don't think I ever heard of his opposition to the Vietnam War which would have been most unpopular in a southern populist state like Arkansas back in the 1970s or early 80s but as he became a national figure he began to speak more openly of how he had opposed the war. I'm not sure now where he stands on right to work. When he ran as attorney general, he was in favor of that piece of legislation that discourages unions. And now he has mollified and modified his position until I don't know where he stands on it. The consuming issue of the South is, and always has been, the racial question and the legacy of slavery. Governor Clinton has succeeded in presenting himself as a healer of the black-white division, and Arkansas has long been a battlefield of this war. In 1957, the first armed confrontation between white supremacy and the federal government came over the integration of Little Rock Central High School. To this day, Bill Clinton has not got around to passing a civil rights statute in Arkansas, which remains one of the only two states of the Union to be without one. Historically, the Democratic Party was punished for its national support of civil rights. Southern white voters, who'd been loyal Democrats since the Civil War, turned massively to George Wallace and his segregation Democrats in 1968. It didn't take long for Richard Nixon to work out that this Democratic protest vote could be converted for the Republicans, who've been carrying the South ever since. Nixon called it the Southern strategy. Reagan called those voters Reagan Democrats. Governor Clinton and his alliance of white Southern Democrats called the Democratic Leadership Council have been fighting to reverse this trend with a Southern strategy of their own. As a consequence, much of Arkansas still looks rather, well, traditional. Like Jimmy Carter, the Southern peanut farmer whose success he hopes to emulate, Bill Clinton doesn't rush things, though he can move fast when he has to. Tucker Prison Farm was where he kept Ricky Ray Rector on death row before signing his death warrant during the New Hampshire primary. The element of shrewd calculation seemed rather too obvious to some. Ricky Rector was a black man who had shot a white police officer and after shooting him he tried to shoot himself. In the process he wounded himself in the head and was operated upon and in the operation, he had a serious frontal lobotomy. They took a chunk uh, of his brain, and people say that after that operation, he was a very different Ricky Rector. Governor Clinton is responsible for overseeing four executions in his tenure as governorship, two of which happened this year in an election year. So. He seems to be very much a part of this national pattern of politicizing the death penalty. I put this thought to James Carville, Clinton's thuggish campaign manager and, while the polls last, darling of a sycophantic press corps. Do you have a southern strategy? 
Well, we've got a southern, and eastern, western, northern <laughs> strategy. I don't, I don't think we have one sort of tra strategy over another, but... Uh, I'll explain what I mean if you like. Sure. Um, Governor Clinton, for example, refused to commute a death sentence on a retarded black prisoner not long ago. Some people thought this was an attempt to show that he was not too far out of touch with that, the good that, old boys. That, let's, let's, let's get the facts right here. This, this prison was no, in no way, shape, or form retarded when he committed the crime. It is very doubtful as he was retarded at the time he was executed. It was a self-inflicted wound after he was convicted, so that's very important. That we did. And uh, that, that's, Governor Clinton has been a persistent and consistent supporter of the death penalty uh, as governor of Arkansas. Uh, to equate that with a southern strategy is, you know, death penalty is popular, you know, all over the country. Thus, Clinton ensured himself against another Willie Horton. National popularity matters all right, and Bill Clinton has certainly pursued it from coast to coast and from pole to pole. Like his southern strategy, his northern, eastern and western strategies consist in looking for demand and then supplying it. He's managed to repeat this trick before audiences everywhere. We all need somebody to lean on. I just might have a problem that you don't understand. We all need somebody. Bill Clinton is never more relaxed, not to say confident, not to say smug, than when coming home himself. In this case, a few weeks ago, to the town, Hot Springs, Arkansas, where he grew up. Thank you. Thank you. I asked Ray Smith, I said, Ray, is this the biggest crowd you ever saw for a political rally in Hot Springs? He said, Marilyn Monroe couldn't have brought out this many people. <laughs> Come to think of it, even the reference to Marilyn Monroe has a Kennedy echo if you know how to look for it. And John Kennedy also ran the most conservative possible Democratic campaign, laced with vaguely uplifting rhetoric. So a year that began with all kinds of rebellion ended with the two-party pendulum swinging much as before. Talk of revolt had given way to bland notions of change. Never mind the grassroots, any roots would do. But America was testing the proposition of one of its greatest writers, Thomas Wolfe, who warned his fellow countrymen, you can't go home again. America is voting now to choose its new president in the closest race since the 1960s. Will Bill Clinton become the first Democrat in the White House for over a decade? Or will George Bush defy the polls and win a second term? We'll be covering the final hours leading up to victory, bringing you the results state by state. Here in Washington and with our correspondents around the United States, we'll explain what it all means and analyze the challenges facing the new president. So join us for Decision 92, tonight on BBC Two at a quarter to midnight. <laughs>